Hello there, my name is Ian Parbury and I'm here to finish talking about geometric primitives. This lecture is for my Game Math and Physics class at uh, UNT in Fall 2011. So I assume you've uh, taken a break, seen the other lecture, taken a break, and then uh, uh, maybe done something else for a while so that you are mentally relaxed and ready to strike. Strike while the iron is hot. I want to start section 9.6, .6, which is about triangles. Now you all know what a triangle is, right? Triangles are, as we've uh, discussed already, fundamental to uh, modeling and graphics. The surface of a complex 3D object, like a car or a human, can be approximated using lots of triangles. We call such a group of connected triangles a triangle mesh, which we'll talk about later. But first, before we learn how to deal with lots of triangles, let's uh, think about single triangles. So, over on the left here, we see uh, a triangulated human head where we've tried to approximate these curves with lots of triangles. Over on the right, we have this uh, walking robot type thing with lots of flat triangles. Robots are cool because they have lots of flat places, so this uses a lot less triangles than this. So, basic properties of a triangle. A triangle is defined by, of course, listing three vertices. As we've discussed, I've said this many, many times, the order that these points are listed is significant. We're going to be using a left-hand coordinate system. We're going to list the points in clockwise order when viewing from the front side of the triangle. So we're going to refer to the three vertices in this lecture as V1, V2, and V3. They're bold-faced, so that they are, if you like, vectors, points. Now, a triangle lies in a plane, right? Three um, points define a unique plane, unless they're collinear, of course. So, a triangle lies in a plane, and the equation of this plane, and as we've seen before, the normal n and the distance to the origin d for the plane is important in a number of applications. Here are the parts of the triangle if you like, the vertices v1, v2, and v3 in clockwise order, looking from the front. The edges uh, e3 runs from vertex 1 to 2, e1 from 2 to 3, and e2 from 3 to 1. You might think uh, that this numbering system is kind of obscure and opaque and, and arbitrary, but um, notice that edge e3 is opposite the vertex v3, E2 is opposite V2, and E1 is opposite V1. That's why we had only E1 and E3 before, and not E2. So, Slotty Bartfoss was right. Things have become suddenly more clear. We can name the angles in the triangle here. Theta 1, Theta 2, and Theta 3, using the same numbering scheme, where Theta 1 is next to V1, Theta 2 is next to V2, Theta 3 is next to V3. We're often interested in edge length. Let L sub i denote the length of E sub i for i equals 1, 2, 3. So L1 is the length of E1, L2 the length of E2, etc., etc. So as I pointed out, E i is opposite V i. Hmm. So given that we know the v's, it's easy to compute the e vectors. E1 is V3 minus V2, yeah, etc., etc., etc. Notice we've got 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and the lengths are, of course, the norms of these um, vectors. Now, you probably met the law of sines and the law of cosines in school, but here's a quick reminder. The sine of theta 1 over L1 is the same as the sine of theta 2 over L2 is the same as sine of theta 3 over L3. The law of cosines relates together um, the lengths with the angle and involves squares. So for example, L1 squared is L2 squared plus L3 squared minus twice L2, L3 cosine of theta 1. So we've got a 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1. 
over here we've got a 2, 1, 3, 1, 3, 2. A 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. So if you remember the general form of this, you can fill in the numbers pretty easily. Now the area of a triangle, the area of a triangle of base B and perpendicular height, or oh, perpendicular height is also called altitude, H is given by the area is BH over 2. Now we've done this before um, in chapter 2 and we can figure it out using this diagram. Heron's formula. Not the bird, the person. If the altitude is not known, then Heron's formula can be used. All you need is the length of the three sides. Let S equal one half the perimeter, also known as semi perimeter. Well, surprise, surprise, semi means half. Um, then the area A is given by the semi perimeter is L1 plus L2 plus L3 over 2, which equals P over 2. The area is then S times S minus L1 times S minus L2 times S minus L3. Cool. We can also compute the area of a triangle directly from the Cartesian coordinates of the points, the vertices. Um, let's do this in 2D first. We start by computing for each edge the signed area of the trapezoid bounded above by the edge and below by the x-axis. So like this, we take for each edge, that's one of the edges, the area of the trapezoid bounded by the edge and the x-axis. That's this trapezoid. No, no, yeah, trapezoid. These two sides are going to be parallel because we're projecting down at right angles to the x-axis. Now by signed area, we mean the area is positive if the edge points from left to right and negative otherwise. So this is going to be positive area, negative area if we were pointing in that direction. There will always be at least one positive edge and at least one negative edge. Mm -hmm. A vertical edge will of course have zero area. The formulas for the areas under each edge are this. The area under say E1 is y3 plus y2 times x3 minus x2 divided by 2. Uh, okay, we've got a 1 over here, we've got 2s and 3s over here, a 2 here, 1s and 3s over here, a 3 here, 2s and 1s over here. So if you memorize off, again, the general form, the pattern uh, is easily filled in. The area under each of these vertices is very similar. So 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, minus sign average, we're done. Okay. By summing the signed areas of the three trapezoids, we arrive at the area of the triangle. So the area is the area of E1 plus the area of E2 plus the area of E3. So the negative areas will cancel out that extra area that we've included all the way down to the x-axis. So taking out the divide by 2 from each of them, we get this. And remember the, the neat pattern, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 1. So let's multiply these out, y3, x3 minus y3x2 plus y2x3 minus y2x2 gets us this line. Likewise, this gives us that. And this stuff over here gives us that. And I've stacked them to reduce space here. It's not a vector. It's a sum. All right. So um, 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 all that divided by 2. And um, a lot of these cancel out. So we've got a plus y3x3, a minus y3x3 here. Yeah, okay. So cancel out the ones that, um, that match here, and we're left with this. Left with, instead of 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them, we've got 1, 2, 6, so half of them are cancelled out. We're left with these. And uh, we can pull a common factor of y1, for example, out of here and here to give us this. Now we can actually simplify that a bit further. The basic idea is that we can translate the triangle without affecting its area, right? So triangles want to be free too, just like vectors. So we can shift the triangle vertically by subtracting y3 from each of the y coordinates. Okay, and uh, we end up then with this formula. A lot of those, the, the last things go away. 
We can also get the area from the cross product. Recall that uh, we earlier said that the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors a and b is equal to the area of the parallelogram formed on two sides by a and b. Since the area of a triangle is half the area of the enclosed parallelogram, we have a simple way to calculate the area of the triangle. You get two edge vectors from the triangle. We know how to get those. The area of the triangle is the um, the magnitude of E1 cross E2 divided by 2. And if you work through the math, this ends up being exactly the same as the method on the previous slide. It's just a little neater because you can do a function call here instead of writing lots of code. Now, we certainly do use triangles in 2D, but as I said, the cool thing about them is that they are inherently planar. The surface of a triangle always lies in a plane. So moving around on the surface of a triangle that's arbitrarily oriented in 3D is, is kind of awkward. It would be nice to uh, think of uh, what it would look like if we were a flea on the surface of the triangle. It would be nice to have a coordinate space then that is related to that surface, relative to that sur surface. And there's a cool one that gets used a lot called barycentric space. It's not what you expect, just Cartesian space. It actually starts out looking quite weird, but is actually very neat when you get used to it. Many practical problems that arise in, in making video games, like interpolation and intersection of triangles, can be solved. Well, I would insert it solved easily, or solved more easily, by using barycentric coordinates. So barycentric coordinates come down to this, in, that uh, any point in the plane of the triangle can be expressed as a weighted sum, as a weighted average, of the vertices. The weights in this weighted average are known as barycentric coordinates. Okay, so for each point we have barycentric coordinates b1, b2, and b3. These correspond, these, uh, okay, given b1, b2, and b3, the point that corresponds to them is b1 times v1 plus b2 times v2 plus b3 times v3, where these are the three vectors of the edges. Ah, that's what they mean, weighted sum. The b's are the weights times the vertices added together. Notice we've numbered them so that this is the uh, barycentric weight corresponding to point 0.1. All right, this is just a linear combination of some vectors. We've already talked about how Cartesian coordinates can also be interpreted as a linear combination of basis vectors. Um, but the uh, subtle distinction between barycentric coordinates and Cartesian coordinates is that um, in barycentric coordinates, we always make sure that the sum of the coordinates is 1. So we make sure barycentric coordinates are, in a sense, normalized. b1 plus b2 plus b3 is always equal to 1. So that uh, I guess that the, the multiplication here then doesn't do any scaling. If these were allowed to be large numbers, then uh, we'd end up with this whole sum if we scaled them all together being very big. We don't really want that. So here's an example of some points and their barycentric coordinates. Note that the vertices of the triangle, uh, V1 for instance, it has barycentric coordinates 1, 0, 0. V2, 0, 1, 0. V3 has barycentric coordinates 0, 0, 1. Notice this centroid here then has barycentric coordinates 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. You'd expect them to be equal, that every vertex has an equal uh, influence on this point, and they are 1 third because, as I said, they've got a sum to 1. This vertex here is closer to V2, so notice that its uh, component of V2 is 0.66. So this point is 0.17 times that vertex plus 0.66 times that plus 0.17 times that. Now, a point that's outside the triangle, you notice it has a negative barycentric coordinate here. Um, we're outside uh, in the direction of V3, so th this is negative. Well, that's a cool way to recognize whether you're inside or outside the triangle, isn't it? Uh, given a point, is it inside the triangle or not? Compute its barycentric coordinates, see if any of them are negative. If there are, it's outside. If there aren't, it's inside. Okay, 
So as I said, the vertices have a trivial form in barycentric space 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 are the vertices that the triangles. All points on the side opposite a vertex will have a 0 for the barycentric coordinate corresponding to that vertex. So for example, B1 equals 0 for all points on the line containing E1, which is, remember, opposite V1. Any point on the plane can be described using barycentric coordinates, not just the ones inside the triangle. Right, they're between 0 and 1 when they're inside, they're negative when they're outside. Or rather, I should say, there's at least one negative value outside. Now, barycentric space essentially tessellates the plane into triangles of the same size as the original triangle. By tessellation, I mean this here. We uh, have tiled the plane, if you like, with images of take this triangle, complete it to make uh, a uh, rectangle here, and then complete tiling the entire plane. So inside here, we have barycentric coordinates between um, 0 and 1. Outside here, we're going to get negative coordinates. We're also going to get them um, yeah, between 1 and minus 1. Notice out here we get, uh, the further away you get, the bigger the coordinates get. Here we have a coordinate reaching 2. Now, the nature of barycentric space is not exactly the same as Cartesian space because um, barycentric space, remember, is 2D, but we're giving three coordinates, the three weights of the three points. We don't need three, right? Because uh, we're 2D, we should only need two things. Since some of the coordinates is 1. Yeah, we normalize the coordinates. Barycentric space really only has 2 degrees of freedom. There is 1 degree of redundancy there. In other words, we could completely describe a point in barycentric space using uh, 2 of the coordinates and compute the third from the other 2. Yeah, 2 would be good because then there wouldn't be any redundancy. Now, in graphics, it's common for these parameters to be computed per vertex or edited, modified per vertex, like our texture coordinates or surface normals or colors or lighting values, all kinds of things that also come up in games, of course. We often need to determine the interpolated value of one of these parameters um, at an arbitrary point or an arbitrary location inside the triangle. This is easy to do using barycentric coordinates. We first determined the barycentric coordinates of the point in interior point, the point in the triangle that we're dealing with, and we take the um, weighted average of the whatever it is we're doing, color, texture, coordinates, lighting, whatever, uh, in the vertices using barycentric weights. So that's cool. When we have to uh, linearly interpolate, if you like, some values, the weights we use for that interpolation can be, or are, are often, barycentric weights. Now another important example is the is intersection testing. Uh, we might want to intersect, for example, ray triangles. So um, does this ray collide with this triangle? So my character is firing a laser beam. Um, I want to make a black mark on my on the character he's he or she is firing at. So we try to figure out which triangle. Oh yeah, doing multi-level collision detection. First we do um, say AABB, then maybe OBB on the parts of the character and then we come down eventually to triangle collision detection. So which triangle does that hit? Well we find that using inside outside test and now where in the triangle has that that ray hit? Ray gun, laser gun? Yeah. A laser gun is a ray gun. It casts a ray. Neat. Um we want to make a black mark where it hits. So where does the ray hit the triangle for us to put that black mark? Okay, we want to determine the point where the ray hits the infinite plane containing the triangle and you know, like I said, determine if it's inside, if so, where? An easy way to make this decision is to calculate the barycentric coordinates of the point using the techniques I'm going to describe now. The point will be inside the triangle if and only if all of the barycentric coordinates are in the 0 through 1 range. Um, barycentric coordinates, as I've said, can be used to fetch some interpolated surface property, like ray casting to determine if a light's visible to some point. Oh yeah, making shadows. Uh, yeah, is is uh, is a point in shadow cast a ray towards the light, 
and see if it hits something. Okay. Suppose we strike a triangle on some model at arbitrary, an arbitrary location. If the model's opaque, the light's not visible, make a shadow. It's harder if the model is uh, uses transparency, so we may be looking through the windscreen, which is tinted blue on some vehicle. We want the shadow to be less dense, of course, and bluish. So if the model uses transparency, we need to determine the opacity at that location to determine what fraction of the light is blocked. Now this is in a texture map which we index using UV coordinates. Now, we've talked a little about that already. Uh, we're talking more when we talk about graphics. Uh, math of graphics in chapter 10. So to fetch the transparency at the location of ray intersection we use the barycentric coordinates at the point to interpolate the UVs from the vertices. Use those UVs then to fetch the, uh, the, the, texel, uh, the texture pixel often called texel from the texture map, and determine the transparency of the, that particular location on the surface by examining the alpha channel, I guess. Now, to make Cartesian coordinates from barycentric is very easy. We've done that already, because the barycentric coordinates um, correspond to this point. So we can get the barycentric coordinates by performing this. This computation is not just an equation, it's a computation too. Um, let's now see how to go backwards, how to determine barycentric coordinates from Cartesian coordinates. So we've got the Cartesian co coordinates of a point. Give me the barycentric coordinates. We'll start with 2D because it's easier. Here we go. Our task. We know the Cartesian coordinates of the three vertices, V1, V2, V3, and the point P. Now it looks like it's at the centroid here, but let's suppose it, it's at some arbitrary place. We want to compute the barycentric coordinates of P, which are B1, B2, B3. It all comes down to simultaneous equations. We have three equations in three unknowns. We're in 2D, so we've got Px and Py, which are the weighted sum of the x-coordinates of the vertices of the tri triangle. We've got a third equation, um, that the sum of the b's has to be 1. Three unknowns three equations. Excellent. Solving the system of equations using the ordinary technique uh, for solving simultaneous equations, I'm not going to drill down into it, gives us b1, b2, and b3 looking like this. Now, let's uh, look a little bit more closely. The denominator of each of these is the same. It's actually um, twice the area of the triangle. What's more, for each barycentric coordinate, the numerator, the top part here, is equal to twice the area of subtriangle TI, where we number the triangles. T1 is opposite V1, T2 is opposite V2, T3 is opposite V3. Ah, oh, okay, that's the area of a triangle. That's uh, you know twice the area of a triangle. We've got lots of areas of triangles floating around here. So in other words, um, BI is the area of TI divided by the area of T for I equals 1, 2, and 3, and that applies even if P is outside the triangle because we get a negative result um, if the vertices are numbered in a counterclockwise order, which is what it looks like from the outside. If the uh, three vertices of the triangle are collinear, then the area in the denominator will be 0, and uh, yeah, we don't want that to happen, so that's a special case you're going to have to check for so you don't get a divide by 0. Now in 3D, it's much more complicated. Um, we can't solve a system of equations like we did before because we have three unknowns and four equations. One equation for each coordinate of P plus normalization. Uh, another complication is P may not lie in the plane of the triangle, in which case barycentric coordinates are undefined. For now, let's do the easy case. Let's assume P lies in the plane containing the triangle. And I'm being a little facetious here. It may be the easy case, but it, it sure is complicated. Um, yeah, when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We know how to do it in 2D, so let's project 3D onto 2D. So turn the 3D problem into a 2D one by discarding one of X, Y, or Z. And that has the effect of projecting the triangle onto one of the three cardinal planes. Now, it sounds weird, but actually it works if you think about it, because the projected areas are proportional to the original areas, so ratio of areas is going to stay the same. 
The kicker is which coordinate should we discard. We can't just pick an arbitrary one and always use it. The first one, say, since the projected points are collinear if the triangle is perpendicular to the projection plane. Yeah, so a triangle seen at edge on is a line. Hmm. If our triangle is nearly perpendicular, it's almost as bad because we have problems with floating point accuracy. So we've got to be a little bit careful here. One solution is to choose the plane of projection so as to maximize the area of the projected triangle. We do this by looking at the plane normal. Whichever coordinate has the largest absolute value is the coordinate we discard. So, for example, if the normal is this, we would discard the y values. So the one with the largest absolute value, yeah, 0.8, 0.26, point, yeah, this is the biggest in magnitude. So we would then discard the y values of the vertices and, uh, and of p. Uh, that means we're projecting onto the xz plane. Let's briefly take a look at some code. Here's a function compute barycentric coordinates 3D. It takes in um, a three dimensional array of vertic uh, vertices, of vectors this is the triangle, it takes in a, a single vector with the point, and we will return in here uh, a 3D vector of floats containing the barycentric coordinates. All right, start out by computing two clockwise edge vectors, v1 minus v0, v2 minus v1. Notice we're in descending order of uh, index here, that's so that we're clockwise. All right, then we compute a surface normal using the cross, cross product. So n is the cross product of d1 and d2, these two vectors. Um, in many cases, we may have pre-computed the surface normal for other reasons, for lighting, for instance. Uh, sometimes we may even include uh, surface normal information in the vertex information. So anyway, um, we don't need to normalize it, but if it's normalized, that's okay. This will work whether or not it's normalized. All right, so case of projecting onto the YZ plane, we find the dominant axis of the normal and select the plane of, plane of projection from that. So um, we look at whether n dot x is bigger than n dot y and bigger than n dot z. So here, let's say x is the biggest in absolute value. So f apps is floating point absolute value. So this is what we do when we discard x. We use only y and z. So notice only y's and z's here. We do one to u4, v2 to v4 are the um, coordinates. Okay, we've dealt with that um, only v0, v2, v2. Okay, next we'll see the case of projecting onto the xz plane. If, if the y is biggest, we discard the y, project onto the xz plane project onto the yz plane. Okay, so if z is biggest, so else, uh, if, if x is not biggest, y is not biggest, then z must be biggest. We do this, discard the z. Notice x is here, y is here, no z's. Otherwise, the code is as we've seen before. So finish up, finishing up, we compute the denominator. It's v1 times u2 minus v2 times u1. Um, we might get uh, some get something invalid here. We don't want to divide by zero, so I'm going to bail out and return false otherwise. Otherwise, we compute the barycentric coordinates. We compute one over the denominator, um, multiply by that. That's a little bit of optimization here, but frankly, these days, any optimizing compiler worth its salt would do that automatically if you did a divide by denom here. Um, anyway, being careful. Uh, compute b0, b1, and b2 using these equations, and uh, sorry, b0, b1 using that. b2 then is, well, remember these have to be normalized, they have to sum to 1, b2 is 1 minus these. Succeed, and so we return. Another technique for computing barycentric coordinates in 3D is uh, based on the method for computing the area of a triangle using cross products. So remember, we're given two edge vectors, E1 and E2, of a triangle. From that, we can compute the area as the uh, magnitude of the cross product, which is the normal to the plane, E1 cross E2, divided by 2. So this is the area of the uh, 
trapezoid containing E1 and E2, and we want a triangle which is half that area. Once we have the area of the triangle and the areas of the three sub-triangles, we can compute barycentric coordinates in the obvious way. But there's one slight problem. The magnitude of the cross product is always positive, and we've been throwing around negative values with the barycentric coordinates given to us by this method are always positive, even for points outside the triangle, which uh, if we're using them for that purpose, for, for doing inside-outside tests, uh, this is not good. So um, what do we do about that? A workaround is, is, um, can be done as follows. What we really need is a way to calculate the length of the cross-product vector that would yield a negative value if the vertices were enumerated in the wrong order. Now, there's a simple way to, to rescue this using dot product. Now, okay, here we go. Let C be the cross product of two edge vectors. Remember, the cross product of two vectors is a vector. Um, remember, the magnitude of C is twice the area of the triangle. Now, let's suppose we have a normal n of unit length, the normal to the triangle. If not, we'll go compute it. n and C are parallel because they're both perpendicular to the plane containing the triangle, and we know n faces what? Um, it faces, yeah, in a left-hand coordinate system away from the front of the triangle towards, uh, towards the front. So we know the orientation of this, we don't know the orientation of that, so why not take the dot product and find out? Um, Right, so we know n is a unit vector. We know the vectors are either pointing the same way or the opposite way. So the dot product c dot n is going to be plus or minus the uh, magnitude of, of c with the sine telling us which direction it's facing. So divide this by 2, then we get the signed area of a triangle in 3D. Okay, so we've rescued it. Armed with this trick, we can now apply the observation that we had earlier, that each barycentric coordinate bi is proportional to the area of the subtriangle ti. As you can see right here, let's um, call di the vector from vi to p. p is the point where uh, our input point. So v1 has a vector d1 to p. From v2 to p, we'll call that d2. From v3 to p, we'll call that D3, remember, given, say, P and V1, we simply subtract them to get a vector either from V1 to P or P to V1. Can you tell me which order that is? Do I go V1 minus P or P minus V1? If you can't answer that, go back and look at the notes. So summarizing the equations for the vectors, here are the vectors E1, E2, and E3, D1, D2, and D3, computed from P our point and our vertices v1 through v3. So e1 is v3 minus v2, e2 is v1 minus v3, e3 is v2. So for 3, only 2 and 1, for 2, only 1 and 3, for 1, only 3 and 2. Cool. d1, d2, and d3 then are p minus v1, p minus v2, p minus v3. And so, yeah, remember, we want to go end point minus beginning point to get a vector from the beginning to the end. I hope you figure that out on the last slide. Um, we also need a, a surface normal. So we'll call that n hat. It's going to be the cross product of the two edge vectors. Oh, uh, divided by its magnitude to make it normalized. I'm using a convention here. I'll put a hat over a vector if I know it to be normalized. The um, areas of the entire triangle T and the three sub-triangles of this. A of T is the entire triangle. A of T1 is the area of triangle 1, etc. And they are each the cross product of two edge vectors dot producted with the surface normal that gives us the area of the rectangle or the, the trapezoid divided by 2 to get the area of the triangle. The barycentric coordinates BI then are given by, well we've seen this before, Bi is the area of Ti divided by the area of T, the whole triangle. Fill in this area of T1 is this, area of T is that. And notice that the, um, so this dot product, that, notice these vectors are the same 
top and bottom here. Hmm. Oh, and the numbers look uh, kind of interesting. B1, E1, D3, E1, E2. B2, E2, D1, E1. Eh, numbers are a little bit complicated here, but there is a pattern. So notice that n hat is used in all of the numerators and all of the denominators. So it's not actually necessary that it be normalized because the size would uh, cancel top and bottom. Um, so this technique for computing barycentric coordinates involves a lot more scale and mass math operations than projection onto 2D. Yeah, but it's branchless. There are no if thens. So if we we are running on a vector coprocessor. It may be faster on a super scalar processor with a vector coprocessor, which is where graphics cards are heading these days. Now, three points on a triangle have special significance, and they're kind of related. There is the center of gravity of the triangle, the incenter of the triangle, and the circumcenter. For each point, let's discuss its geometric significance and construction and uh, give a method for computing its barycentric coordinates. Now, the center of gravity, also known as the centroid, is the point on which the triangle would balance perfectly. It's the intersection of the medians. A median is a line from a vertex to the midpoint of the opposite side. So take V1. Take the opposite edge, find the midpoint of the opposite edge, draw a line through V1. Same with V2, same with V3. They, these three lines, the medians, um, always intersect at this point, which is the center of gravity of the triangle. Center of gravity, then, is the geometric average of the three vertices. Surprise, surprise, surprise. You got a hint about this earlier, didn't you? Uh, its barycentric coordinates are then one third, one third, one third. The incenter is the point in the triangle that's equidistant from all sides. It's the center of a circle inscribed in the triangle. So take your triangle, draw a circle, find the center of the circle, and that's it. It turns out to be the intersection of the angle bisector. So we take this angle, for instance, bisect it draw a line at that angle, do the same for all three of the vertices, and those lines will intersect at the incenter. So to compute the incenter, suppose the triangle has sides of length L1, L2, and L3, and that P, which is the sum of L1, L2, and L3, is the perimeter. Yeah, the length of the outside is obtained by summing the length of all the Edges, then the incenter, we'll call it C in, is given by this. It's, we use these lengths, L1 as weights times the uh, vectors, making, okay, so this is the length of the edge opposite V1. That's the length of the edge opposite V2. So length of edge opposite times point. Add those all together. So the result then is a, a, a 3D vector. Um, divide by the perimeter. So that, that, parameter, in a sense, uh, normalizes that uh, these lengths L1, L2, and L3. So this is like kind of like a normalized weighted sum of the vertices. Uh, surprise, surprise, then. The barycentric coordinates of the incenter then are L1 over P, L2 over P, and L3 over P. Yeah, these are barycentric coordinates. more in the incenter, the radius of the inscribed circle can then be computed by dividing the area of the triangle by its perimeter. Oh wow, neat. So the radius of that uh, inscribed circle is A divided by P. And that also solves the problem of finding a circle tangent to three lines. If I give you three lines, find a circle in, in three, three lines in a plane, find a circle tangent to all of them. Yeah, it's that one. Now the circumcenter is the point in the triangle that's equidistant from the vertices. Over here on the right, three vertices, V1, V2, V3, the um, circumcenter is this point. It's equidistant from here, here, and here. Neat. This is the um, 
center of a different circle, a circle that circumscribes the triangle. This is a circle that hits all three of the vertices. There is only one circle that hits all three vertices. We construct the circumcenter as the intersection of the perpendicular bis bisectors of the side. So for each side, um, I'm, I'm divided in to uh, project perpendicular from that point. Do that for all three of the sides and they will um, intersect at the circumcenter. So to compute the circumcenter, let's compute first some intermediate values. Let d1 be negative of the dot product of e2 and d3, that's the others, not 1. 2, e3 and e1, d3, e1 and e2, okay. Let c1 equal d2 times d3, so again we have, uh, uh, notice the indices here, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2, that's because of the, the cunning way in which we've numbered everything. Let c be the sum of c1, c2, and c3, then the barycentric coordinates of the circumcenter are, the first coordinate is c2 plus c3 over 2c, the second is c1 plus c3, over 2c, the third is c1 plus c2. So notice there are no 1s here, there are no 2s here, there are no 3s here. All of them are divided by 2c. <coughs> the circumcenter then is the... So these things are, as I said, barycentric coordinates. So the circumcenter is given by those weights times the uh, vertices. Now the radius of that circle, called the circumradius, is this, square root of d1 plus d2 times d2 plus d3 times d3 plus d1 divided by c all over 2. Now the circumradius and circumcenter solve the problem of finding a circle passing through three points. So if you're given three points and told find a circle through them, you simply find the circumcenter and the circumradius and the answer is a circle about the center of that radius. Now, onto polygons, many-sided figures which may, of course, include triangles. So a polygon is a flat object made up of vertices and edges. A polygon that doesn't have any holes is called a simple polygon. Uh, one that may have holes is called, or one that does have holes is called, complex. So over here on the right, here we have a triangle, it's simple, here we have a rectangle with a square hole in it, so that's complex. So all of these are simple, all of these are complex because of the holes. A simple polygon can be described by listing the vertices in clockwise, in, well, in some order around them, and we're going to do it in clockwise order. That doesn't take account of the holes, so we can't use it for complex polygons. Now, in the time since I last put up the slide, I shut things down, went off, made a cup of coffee, and come back. So I've got an excellent cup of coffee here. Ah, good. We can turn any complex polygon into a simple one by adding pairs of seam edges, as shown here. So this, for example, is a uh, complex polygon. We clues it into uh, a simple one by adding some extra seam edges here where um, they don't quite meet. So um, we've drawn them over here as not meeting, but yeah, actually they're on top of each other. Different vertices, different edges. This happened to be in the same place. So we add two edges. Um, when ordered around the polygon, the two seam edges then point in opposite directions. So this one might go in this direction, yeah, 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 that one will go in that direction. Now, there are also self-intersecting polygons, which really make a mess of things. The edges of most simple polygons don't intersect. If they do, the polygon is called self-intersecting. Um, it's easier to arrange things so we don't have them, or we reject them. But of course, the artist might accidentally give you one, so you need to be alert. It's not a huge bur burden on the programmer to, um, to, to uh, or, or on the uh, designer or artist not to ever have them. They're evil. Non-self-intersecting, so from now on I'm going to be non-self-intersecting, simple polygons can be further classified as either convex or concave. 
Now, giving a precise definition for convex is actually tricky because there are lots of special cases, degenerate cases. But uh, the general case is, is pretty easy. For most polygons, the following commonly used definitions are equivalent, although there are some degenerate cases that this classification may classify as being convex according to one definition, concave according to another, but whatever, they're degenerate, then either. So here's three definitions. Number one. Intuitively, a convex polygon doesn't have any dents. Yeah, my mini has a dent in the back that I need to get pulled out. You know what a dent is? It's a little concavity. Mm. A concave polygon has at least one vertex that is a dent called a point of concavity. In a convex polygon, the line between any... Okay, number two. Two is a different definition. In a convex polygon, the line between any two points in the polygon is completely contained within the polygon. Yeah, if they're both in two points inside, you draw a line between them. The line is inside too, unless you've gone through a point of concavity there. Oh, cool. In a concave polygon, we can find a pair of points in the polygon for which the line between them is partially outside the polygon. As we move around the perimeter of a convex polygon, so this is definition number three, at each vertex we turn in the same direction. In a concave polygon, we'll make some left-hand turns and some right-hand turns. Okay, that's cool. We turn the opposite direction at points point or points of concavity. Oh, for non-self-intersecting polygons, notice uh, things do get a bit messy here. Okay, so some rules for the practicing programmer. Number one, if my code that is only supposed to work for convex polygons can deal with it, then it's convex, by definition. Rule number two, uh, alternately, would be if my algorithm that tests for convexity decides it's convex, then it's convex. This is like the, uh, you know, the first law of computer graphics. If it looks right, it is right. So we tend to say, we're going to use a simple algorithm, and if it says it's convex, yeah. If, if it's degenerate, then who cares what the answer is? We'll just say it's convex. So here's some easy to agree on examples. Over on the left, it's easy to see this triangle is convex. This uh, yeah, funny looking shape is convex. These two though are obviously concave. Here's the cave right here in, and there are some caves there in, and it's clear what the points of concavity are, the points where, yeah, the, where we go into a, uh, a dent, if you like. So how do we test whether a polygon is convex or concave? Excuse me, I need some coffee here. Ah, good coffee. One method is to examine the sum of the angles at the vertices. Hmm? Okay, well, start by considering a convex polygon with n vertices. The sum of the interior angles in a convex polygon is n minus 2 times 180. Is that right? Think about a triangle. 3 minus 2 is 1 times... Yeah, some of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So this looks cool. There are, in fact, two different ways to show this. It's easy for a triangle, but what about for arbitrary n? Here's the first method. First we let um, theta i measure the interior angle of vertex vi, the ith vertex. Since the polygon is convex, this angle is less than or equal to 180, yeah. The amount of turn that occurs at vertex i is 180 minus theta, which is a positive angle because this is less than or equal to 180. A closed polygon turns one complete revolution, or 360 degrees. Therefore, the sum over each vertex of 180 minus the angle at that vertex is 360. Um, so we've got n lots of 180 here minus the sum of those angles is 360. So negative the sum of the angles is 360 minus n times 180. We've taken this and subtracted over here. Um, so take uh, the negative of both sides. That sum is n times 180 minus 360. And uh, we can factor out 180 out of this 180 times n minus 2. So n minus 2, 180. Okay, yeah, that's where the n minus 2 comes from. The second method uh, is this, as we're going to show a bit later. Any convex polygon with n vertices can be triangulated into n minus 2 triangles. 
Hey, there's that magic number two again. From classical geometry, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, or from high school when your teacher drummed it into you. So the sum of the interior angles of all the triangles of a triangulated polygon is n minus 2 times 180. Yeah, right. Uh, n minus 2 triangles, so n minus 2 times this 180. And that sum also must be equal to the sum of the interior angles of the polygon. Now this appears to be a bit of a red herring, and uh, those of you who have read uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide trilogy, all five volumes of it, know that, will know that herrings come up a lot um, in several places. Uh, robots have herring sandwich scoops, for instance, and here is uh, what the discerning robot might uh, eat instead of herring sandwiches. Herring packets. Anyway, a bit of a red herring because the sum of the interior angles is n minus 2 times 180, whether the polygon is concave or convex. Hmm. Yeah, we're trying to determine whether it's convex and concave, so how does this help us? Well, dot product to the rescue. The trick is that for a convex polygon, the interior angle is not larger than the exterior angle, whereas for concave one, it is. So take the sum of the smaller angle at each vertex, whether that's the interior or exterior, the sum is going to be n minus 2 times 180 for convex polygons, and less than that for concave polygons. Okay, so how do we compute the smaller angle? Well, luckily we have a tool to do just that, the dot product. So remember the dot product, we can compute the angle between two vectors using dot product, and it's always the interior, the shortest. It's not it's always theta, not 360 minus theta, right? It's always the shortest one. So here we go. With a function, is polygon convex given the number of vertices and uh, pointed to an array of vertices, right? how many there are going to be, n of them. So this is how to fool C++ uh, into uh, taking an arbitrary length um, vector, um, arbitrary length array of vectors. All right, so initialize a sum, angle sum to zero radians, go around the polygon and sum the angle at each vertex. So for yeah, yada, 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 for each i, get the edge vectors. So E1 is um, yeah, the d difference between two edges and, yeah, of course, wrapping around the, the, the top. This is uh, the degenerate end case. This is the general case. Okay. We've computed uh, E1, computing E2 is the same kind of thing, degenerate end edge case, the main case. Normalize the two, compute the dot product. Oh, E1 star, E star must be overloaded to mean dot product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Compute the smaller angle using a safe function that protects against rage errors. Range errors, sorry, not rage, range. It could be caused by numerical imprecision. So let theta be safe a cause of dot. What will this do? Aren't cause if it makes sense. Give it a good value if it doesn't. Um, sum it up. So angle sum gets add, you add theta to it. Alright. And then we compute the convex angle sum which as we've seen is n minus 2 times uh, pi um, hmm. Some of the angles should be this. Um, check if the sum of the angles is less than it should be, in which case we're concave. So if we're concave, return false. If we're convex, return true. And um, what are we doing here? We're trying to make sure, we're trying to test whether angle sum is less than convex angle sum, but we want a little bit of uh, numerical imprecision here. So we're allowing this much imprecision. Now another method for determining determining convexity is to search for vertices that are points of concavity. Yeah, look at each vertex, see if it's a point of concavity. If there are none, then the polygon is convex. Mm, good coffee. The basic idea is that every vertex should turn in the same direction. Anyone, as we've said before, that turns in the opposite direction is a point of concavity. So we can determine which way it turns using cross-product of 
edge vectors return recall from chapter two in the left-handed coordinate system the cross product should point towards you if the vectors form as we want a clockwise term so what does towards you mean in this case let's view the polygon from the front as determined by the polygon normal if it's not available to us then we can compute it right uh, cross product of edges but we need to exercise some care we really want the best fit normal from a set of points because the vertices of that polygon excuse me may no longer be planar due to numerical imprecision so just taking two consecutive <gasps> excuse me edges and computing the cross product might not be right so compute the best fit normal using the uh, technique we saw earlier Okay. Once we've got that polygon normal, compute a vertex normal at each vertex by taking the cross product of the adjacent clockwise edge vectors. If we take the dot product of the polygon normal with the vertex normal, check whether it's positive or negative to determine whether they point in the opposite directions. If the dot product is negative, then we've located a point of concavity. Now, Graphics hardware needs triangles, so we end up, uh, artists may uh, and often do create models that are uh, made of polygons, not triangles. We need to triangulate them before we can draw them using the graphics hardware. So how do you triangulate a polygon? The, of course, any polygon can be divided into triangles, and um, so, yeah, any operations or calculations that we did for triangles we can apply to polygons just by applying them to the triangles and then combining them but triangulating arbitrary uh, polygons is is really uh, not trivial I could spend a lot of time talking about it but we're going to be hopefully our artists will provide us with we're going to be dealing with mostly almost always simple convex polygons and triangulating them is trivial one obvious technique is to pick a vertex, any vertex will do, like the first one, and make what's called a triangle fan around that vertex, like this. So here is a polygon made up of v1, v2, v3, v4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So yeah, that's a pretty odd looking polygon. We triangulate it by picking, say, v1, and then drawing lines here to all of the other vertices, making a bunch of triangles. Notice here these triangles are pretty thin. We could end up running into trouble if um, they get too thin. When computing a surface normal, for example, um, things can go bad when we've got long, thin triangles. Numerical imprecision can uh, rear up to bite us in the face. Some graphics cards uh, really do a terrible job clipping long edges to the view frost them, so that's not good. There are smarter techniques though that exist to minimize this problem. One idea is to triangulate as follows. Now, we can divide a polygon into two pieces with a diagonal between two vertices. When this happens, the two interior angles at the vertices of that diagonal are each divided into two new interior angles, so we have four new interior angle. So to subdivide a polygon, select the diagonal. There are many of them going from vertex to vertex, right? So uh, I guess there are uh, n times n minus one of them. Uh, select the one that maximizes the smallest of the four new interior angles. Divide the polygon in, in two using that diagonal and then recurse on each half until you get only triangles. This algorithm is guaranteed to result in a triangulation with fewer slivers. Go look it up if you're interested. All right, that concludes chapter nine. Next, we've got some really interesting stuff. Applying math, in particular the math we've learned so far, to 3D graphics. Bye.